All right. So as we sort of started going through our Passover, Passover texts, and we studied out really um, what Scripture talks about when we deal with the setup to Passover, right? So we spoke a lot about covenant in Genesis 15. We spoke a lot about the build-up as God was dealing with the gods of Egypt and how He was taking on each and every single god to make the point of this is what you put your trust in but it's not real okay so we stop and we go okay father surely if we can see this these sort of four shadows and types i'm going to see this passover link because we understand that he's our passover land that when we put these things together we're going to see something else so Today I just want to peel back one layer. Obviously it's multifaceted with God. There's many different things that we have to look at. But for the sake of time and for us focusing up mainly on Passover, um, as you go through the feast things will become more apparent. And guys, this is just again one layer. I want to look at some of the miracles in his ministry and how it spoke to those three categories that he was trying to teach Egypt and the world. Can you guys remember what the point of plagues 1, 2 and 3 were? This is the part where you open up your notebook and you go look back from last week. I love y'all's enthusiasm that you're going to remember everything I said. Hmm? Plagues 1, 2 and 3. Remember, we stopped, we looked at the verse. God was setting it up. What's the point? Alright, he said, I am Adonai, so that you will know that I am God. Alright, so the first three plagues, when he started to challenge them, and he started to deal with, can you remember the first three wonders? What, off the top of your head? What was the first real one besides the throwing us uh, the staff coming down and turning into a, a serpent? What did he strike first? Water, right? Okay. So we're going to have this image of a Nile that's actually going to pop up in one of these miracles. So I want to look at if we can see in the beginning of Messiah's earthly ministry. Is there something that kind of would make this link? So I want you to think a little bit. I've got two examples here that I would like to pursue with you. But in the beginning of his ministry, what were the first sort of miracles he did? Right, first one normally off the bat, the wedding in Cana. Alright, so open up your Bibles quickly to John chapter 2. So when we look at this reality, remember, we're setting up Passover, okay? So if Yeshua is making the point that I am who I say I am, I should see this in something. And what I love about this wedding in Cana is it sets up quite a bit more. So John chapter 2 verse 1, it says, On Tuesday, or in your translations, what does it say? The third day. The third day, okay? So there's something that's interesting about this. If you go and you look at the creation and you study it out, it just happens to be the day that if you read it carefully, God says it's good twice. All right? So it's on day three. He goes, it's good and it's good. And then this becomes such an exciting revelation to people, specifically the Jewish nation, that they decide that the best day to get married is on a Tuesday. Isn't it interesting that we see this sort of excitement actually parallel here in the Gospels? On the third day, or on a Tuesday, there was a wedding in Cana. Now, if we missed the Genesis idea, you would think a wedding on a Tuesday sounds a bit odd, right? We're sitting in Cana, it's in the Galilee, and the mother of Yeshua was there. Yeshua, too, was invited to the wedding, along with his disciples. 
The wine ran out and Yeshua's mother said to him, they have no more wine. Yeshua replied, mother, why should that concern me or you? My time hasn't come yet. So remember, when you look at the Gospel of John, he's very focused on, it's not my time, until he pops up and he goes, my time is now. Just while we're looking at the bigger context, what's the point of the Gospel of John? Why is John writing this Gospel? What is he trying to prove? In the beginning there was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's trying to prove the divinity of Christ. Okay, so when he sets this up, he's proving that he is. What's the point of plagues one, two, and three? I am God. So he sets this up and he goes, his mother said to his servants, you've got to love this mommy. He's like, why should they concern you? And she's just like, ignore him. Table servants, do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water jars were standing there for ceremonial washings, each with a capacity of 20 or 30 gallons. Yeshua told them, fill the jars with water. They filled them to the brim. He said, now draw some out and take it to the man in charge of the banquet. And they took it. Now you've got to remember, we've got stone jars for ceremonial cleansing, obviously a mikvah of sorts. He says, fill them up, but don't just test it first. Take it to the guy who runs the ceremony. You see a lot of that when you look at the miracles. He'll say to a leper, he says, all right, if you want to be clean, go and show yourselves to the priests. And it's in that motion of turning around and walking forward that their faith gets shown. And they say, because he said it, I'm going to do it. I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know when this is going to change, but I'm going to take those first steps. You see, with God, it's about trusting that He's going to do it in the midst of it. He doesn't explain it before you see it, and then once you see it, then you do it. You've got to turn around, you've got to grab the thing, and you've got to walk it out, because He said so. He'll take it to rest. So He says, The man in charge tasted the, tasted the water, and it had now turned to wine. He, said, he, sorry, he did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. So he called the bridegroom and he said to them, everyone else serves the good wine first and the poorer wine after the people have drunk freely. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of Yeshua's miraculous signs that he did in Cana, in the Galil. He manifested his glory and his Talmudim came to trust in him. All right. So isn't this an interesting little picture? The first miracle Yeshua really does is to reaffirm the fact that there is a bridegroom and a bride. Now that should tell you something. If we understand that we are the bride of the Christ, he's trying to tell you he's setting up something. So he brings us to a point where this water into wine actually sets up his earthly ministry. How does it do that? Now remember, I don't want you to think in a Greek fashion. I want you to think like good Hebrews. Hebrews think in pictures. All right? Where does Yeshua's public ministry start? When he gets announced. I'll give you a clue by a guy called John. At his baptism, right? Okay, he pitches up and God says, This is my beloved son. You with me? Okay. So what starts at water? So if wine is our next picture, what picture near the end of his earthly ministry tells us where he's dealing with wine? Okay, we can go to the crucifixion as a symbol of blood, but I'm talking about wine specifically. Okay, what we call the Last Supper, the Pesach meal. When he says, this is my blood, he takes the cup and he gives a bracha. He says he took a cup of wine, after the meal and he offers it to his disciples okay so from the beginning of his ministry to near the end of his ministry he says guys it's going to be all about a marriage yes well you can look at it that way you can as well in the garden of gethsemane Okay, so what Tanesh is talking about is, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he talks about, <clears throat> he says, Father, <clears throat> Father, let this cup pass from me. 
right? And we think, okay, well, there's been this, this wine and this blood covenant, and he says, you know, drink of this, and this is my blood. And then all of a sudden, he looks at a cup and he says, no thanks. <coughs> Jeremiah talks about a cup of wrath that God tells Jeremiah to give out to all the nations, and he says, you're going to drink of my fury. And that cup shows us that, again, he took the wrath of God on, on our behalf. Okay, so we could draw to that. And when we see the picture of water <coughs> and red wine or blood linking together, <coughs> we see that at the crucifixion. Right? What came out of his side? Water and blood. Okay, so he says, I am Mother Night. You guys following me? <coughs> All right, another miracle that we could probably look into is him calming the storm. Okay, you guys remember you were sitting on a boat, okay, having a snooze, as one does. Things rocking, going back and forth, the disciples are freaking out, everybody's panicking, they wake him up, why do they wake him up? Do you not care that we're about to perish? Translate that for me, so that you're not thinking, oh, King Jamesy. When I wake up someone and the boat is getting underwater, what am I really asking? Start getting the water out the boat. They didn't expect Yeshua to get up and look at the storm and go, okay guys, let's everybody just calm down. They were nervous, they were panicking, and he wants to show them, guys, I'm bigger than this, but remember you're dealing with a rabbi, number one. So a rabbi is always teaching. Number two, you're dealing with the word in flesh. So when you're sure it does a miracle, he wants to point you back to something. Okay? How many of you know what a remez is? Just quickly stick up your hand. Alright, so a remez is a typical rabbinic linking tool. Okay, so what it does is, it's either by using a word or it's by doing an action. So when I say to you, for God so loved that, is it just one world? World? What's the rest of the line? He gave His only begotten Son. Right. Okay. And that's John 3, 16. All right. Now tell me what John 3, 14 says. All right. There's only one of you. So tell me the context of John 3. So Sean has been terrorized by me a lot over the years. So she's memorized these portions. Okay, so what happens is, is that when I quote John 3.16, what I'm actually telling you is that you need to be born again, Nicodemus. Okay, you understand the logic? So when Yeshua does something by action or by deed, He's not necessarily just following the quoted text. He's telling you to look behind and in front because they memorize things in portions. So He's telling you, this is, there's a bigger picture. Go and study out that portion, that chapter before and that chapter after, and then we'll talk about what I'm really trying to say. A typical rabbinic way of doing this is saying, Nancy leaves her Bible at my house. She came to have tea and cookies, and she left her Bible, and then she comes back, and I look at her and I say, Man shall not live by bread alone. But by? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. What am I telling you? You forgot your food. Now, if we don't understand the way that rabbinic thought or that pattern works, we miss the point of what he's trying to show us. So a good rabbi comes up and he stands up after everybody's freaking out and then he says, What? Shalom, peace, and everything just calms down. And we go, That's fantastic, you know, look at that. But they ask the question. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? I want to show you something that was quite exciting when I found it. I want you to go to Psalm 107. Now, funny enough, this is not the only psalm that you can examine here. But I want you to pay attention to around verse 29. I'm going to read a little bit more. But for the sake of time... Guys, I invite you, please go read the whole psalm. I'm going to read from verse 25. Psalm 107, verse 25. For at his word the storm or the wind arose, lifting up towering waves. The sailors were raised up to the sky, they plunged into the depths, 
At the danger, their courage failed them. They reeled and staggered like drunk men. All their skill had swallowed, was swallowed up. Remember, you're dealing with fishermen, competent men that are on the Sea of Galilee virtually every day. And before we start to go, okay, it's the Sea of Galilee, but it's actually a lake. You're right. So how big can a lake's waves actually get? We know a guy in Galilee who does um, worship songs, a guy by the name of Daniel Carvel. We went on his boats and we do it quite often when we take tours. And he says, you look at this now when you think it's calm. Yesterday there were six foot waves. Then you would have seen a storm. And when you look at the size of those little fishing canoes, six foot is a big problem in that boat that they were at. Okay, so it says here, verse 28, In their trouble they cried to Adonai. What's the point of plagues 1, 2, and 3? I am the Lord. They cried to Adonai and he rescued them from their distress. He silenced that storm and stilled its waves. And they rejoiced as the sea grew calm. Then he brought them safely to their desired place. Who am I? Plagues 1, 2, 3. In two simple miracles, we can trace back to the written word and we can look at the point and he says, Guys, if you understand that I am the Passover lamb, I'm setting up the same reality. You guys with me? Was there a God that? Was there a God that? Alright, there was. Okay, so when you look at the Sea of Galilee, um, I don't know if Bruce can bring up a picture. Okay, it's called the uh, Kinevet today. Um, it's because it's in the shape of a Kinor. A Kinor is a harp shape, okay? Now, when we look at the Sea of Galilee, we need to understand that there are two different sections. The northern section, um, just tell me when it's up. Okay, basically when you get down sort of halfway through the right hand side, just below the eastern, the eastern side of the lake if you want to put it, and down around south, we actually have a lot of pagan cities. It was called the Decapolis. Deca means ten polis means cities. There were ten Gentile nations that were in this region. Okay, so when you're dealing at north and more western side, you're going to find that's where most of the, the Jews hung out. Okay, Capernaum, Chorazin, and that was at the northern side of the Galilee. All right, you can see where Capernaum is at the top there. It's the one with the name running across. But when we start to get down about halfway through to the right hand side, a little bit further down, about there, you're going to hear of a territory which will come up by a man who we call Legion. He was in that territory. Okay. So when you're crossing to go to the other side, I don't want you to think of just crossing over to the lake. We are literally going from the I'm safe here with the God-fearing side and now I'm going to the other side. And if we had to carry on with the story when he calmed the wind and the waves, where did he park his boat? Right outside a bunch of graves where Legion came out. Which makes me kind of giggle because in Psalm 107 it says it came to the desired location safely. And then they met a guy called Legion. So now, in their mind, remember when Yeshua was walking on the water, what did they scream? It's a, it's a ghost. There's some spiritual element over here coming across. So they thought, probably because of the wind and the waves, it's a possibility that the god Baal, was, who was depicted with a lightning bolt in his hand, was in control of that region, and God was challenging the very dominion of Baal and said, Who is God? You with me? Nothing else has power here. I stand above all. All right. Okay. Any other questions? You good? Yeah. On both sides. Yeah, remember when you're dealing with, when you're picking up in, the, in, in Scripture, when you're dealing from territory to territory, remember, when you go to Phoenicia, up in Tyre and Sidon, it's always a challenge. The God of Phoenicia versus the God of the Hebrews. 
When the Philistine came out with Goliath, it was the God of the Philistine versus the God of the Hebrews. And whoever wins, you can find this weird dynamic we have today. Except we pin Satan up against God, right? And there's apparently an arm wrestling match in some people's minds. I know that's the way I understood it before I really studied out scripture, is that there was some sort of challenge. But the reality is, there's no real challenge. God stands up and everybody else is forced to sit down. He looks at you and he goes, you're trusting in that, that's cute, can't do anything. You want peace, you want safety, you want to, you want to understand why you were created, you want to understand who I am. I'm standing right in front of you. No worries. Well, it's kind of a, it's a mix of both, because if you look at Isaiah and those things, they also say that you chop down a tree, you use some for firewood, you use some for carve out an idol, you use some to make furniture, and then you bow down to the part of the tree. And he was like, really? You chopped up some, you made a couch out of some, but now you worship some, and that thing's supposed to take care of you? But we know there is a very active demonic force. If we look at the story of Passover, when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, he took his staff and he threw it down and it turned into a... Alright, can I put snake in the back burner? I'm not saying it wasn't and I'm not saying it was. The Hebrew word for snake is nakash. If you study out the Hebrew, it doesn't use that term nakash. It uses a term for great serpent, a reptile. Okay, so if you study a little bit of Egyptology, you will understand that this could very possibly be a crocodile. All right, which changes our picture quite a bit because how can our crocodile eat other crocodiles, but it's the reality. The reason I say it could possibly be because the crocodile was the protector of Pharaoh himself. So what is God trying to say? Your protection has now been removed, I'm greater. Okay, so then the question we've got to ask ourselves, if Moses was empowered by God, what was empowering the Magi? Let's make no mistake. Demons are real. Okay? Should we worry about them too much? Not really. Because wherever you trade, if you have the Ruach, you have authority. And we need to understand that in our identity. The reality is, we serve God. Who can stand before Him? No one, right? So, but there is this reality. Okay? Plagues 1, 2, and 3. I am other one point made okay plagues four five and six what was the point of plagues four five and six this is the part where you pretended you wrote notes right i can distinguish between my people and not okay so now you've got to set your mind up is god is going to be dealing with different people groups Okay, and one of the easier ones to do this is understand that at one point he's making, he's talking to, to the Jews, and at other times he's talking to Gentiles. Alright, and a quick one that we can do is the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. If this is news to you, how many of you thought there was only one feeding? Don't worry, I was also there until I studied it out. Okay, so the feeding of the 5,000, what? And we've, we've just... For you guys just to give you a little bit of an introduction when god gives you a number ask why why couldn't it be the feeding of the 2000 because he's trying to tell you something okay some people understand five five is normally a number that reflects what torah the first five books of the bible which talks about god's instruction that's what torah means okay so that which we find where god says i instruct so a jewish mindset five thousand Five, I'm talking to the written word. Remember, he's sitting on a place called Tabcha. Um, okay, Sea of Galilee side again. If we start looking up to Capernaum and then we just go slightly to the side, okay? Shabbat Shalom. When we start going just to the side, okay, so from where I am, if I'm standing at Capernaum, not where the Kinor shape comes in, the harp shape, but we're going to go towards Kergesa. 
Okay, it's in that region, not far from Capernaum itself. This is where the feeding of the 5,000, we believe, took place. Okay, it's in the kosher side of town. God-fearing territory. So we have 5,000 men and just the men counted. And we come up and we see this miracle. And you remember, he says, you give them something to eat. And they go, hmm, where are we going to find this amount of bread? I just, what are you really trying to say? But remember, a rabbi is always teaching and he says, look, if they're looking just for food, you're missing the point. Man, these guys are hungry. They're hungry for God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by? But to show you that God can take little and multiply it, he takes some fish and a couple of loaves of bread and he goes, all right, picks it up and he does a bracha, a blessing. And then he starts to tear it and dish it out. And how many baskets did they pick up? 12. Why 12? Why not 17? Why not 3? 12 is a number of the tribes. Remember, you had 12 disciples for a reason. It was a representation of the people. So he stands up and he's telling them, I'm the bread of life for Israel. Okay, and then after we have this little running with Legion, which is rather interesting, right? He parks his boat over there. And, you know, I have this running movie playing in my head. Can you imagine being a disciple? Big storm, you land on the side, Yeshua jumps out, and you hear a guy start screaming who's been cutting himself, with chains still attached to him, and he sprints towards you. Oh yeah, and he's also, yeah, kind of naked. So, everybody's having a good time. It's normally around that point where, you, if you study the text out, I've, I didn't really see the disciples ever climbed out of the boat. They probably parked it over here and go, what are we doing here? And that guy comes out. Now you start thinking, well, he saved us over there. We came safely to our desired location. Please int introduce Legion. Now what I love about this story is, sorry I'm expanding, but this is it's an amazing reality is that he's going to come and God's going to deal with him and cast them out and we're going to see a herd of swine run down the hill and go into the water, right? Afterwards, everybody sees this man who was possessed sitting in his right mind. And as a good natural response, we take the guy who made him change and we want to chase him away. So, the man formerly known as Legion decides he's going to climb in the boat and Yeshua says, mm -mm. He points him back to the territory of the, the Decapolis and he says, Now you go and tell them what God has done for you. Now you need to understand what a big statement that was because they believed in many different gods and now this guy whom they couldn't fix now he has to go give a testimony and they say, how are you in your right mind? And he says, well, the God of the Hebrews pitched up and he just kind of got rid of it. A few thousand demons and now I'm okay. And because of that testimony, when Yeshua comes back later, all of a sudden, Gentiles are running in there with their sick. Four thousand men. Why the number four? This four is normally a representation of yud he vav he God's very name. And he comes up and then he feeds them again. How many baskets? Seven. Why seven? Which Gentile nations? You're right. If we look at what God told Joshua that he was going to kick out he gives them a list of nations. It wasn't just the Canaanites, it was the Amorites, it was the Hittites, it was the Hivites, it was the Jebusites. He lists seven nations. Did Joshua and them get rid of them? Not entirely. This is the land of Israel. Why do we have ten pagan cities around the Galilee? Why do we have a man with a legion of demons in him? It's because this territory wasn't completely claimed. But because God so loved the world, he pitches up and he goes, all right, let's talk, who's your God? 
shows them the miracle of legion and then he feeds them and he gives them seven baskets of food what's the point i'm the god of israel the bread of life i'm the god of the gentile the bread of life another example before we get there for the sake of time is it important okay is another miracle i want you guys to go to look for quickly ask me after okay while you're paging to look for i'm going to expound on 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 legion just a little bit so i want you to look at the man legion stuck between two cultures on the jewish side what do we prize people that worship god right people that stick to god's instruction people that reflect him in every way shape and form now let's compare where the legion would fit into that reality demon possessed cuts themselves running around naked staying in tombs unclean 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 and i don't really want to get close to that thanks very much would he have fitted in into a nice jewish synagogue it's okay you can say no that's the right answer now let's look at the roman culture what did the romans prize beauty intellect sports prowess remember this was a place where philosophy was encouraged if you were exceptional in your, your unique identity we wanted to lift you up how awesome your status your very laws the Roman laws depicted who you can talk to and who you couldn't, what you could do and what you couldn't do according to your social ranking. They enjoyed things like gymnasia, theatres, bathhouses, swimming pools. Sound familiar? You're more Roman than you want to care about? I'm let you think. Would Legion fit into a Roman world? No, he was out of his mind, couldn't be controlled, he was full of scars. The Jews didn't want him, Rome didn't want him, but God did. He didn't go and just happen to walk past him and he jumped out. He parked his boat at the beach where he knew he would find him. And I want you to think, this Passover story is how far will God go to get to you? Jump into Luke 4 with me. I'm looking at from verse 16. This is where Yeshua goes into the Galilee and he starts to teach in his hometown synagogue. Okay, so he's in Netzeret in Nazareth. And it says, Yeshua returned to the Galilee and the power of the Spirit and reports about him, um, I'm just reading from 14, spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone respected him. Okay, so this is a great man of God. This is where we are. Now, when he went to Netzeret, to Nazareth, where he had been brought up on Shabbat, he went into a synagogue, as usual. Your translations? as was his custom okay remember Yeshua says Shabbat is a holy convocation and because we're following our rabbi to become like Christ we do the same okay so we get up and we go into synagogue and he is going to expound on God's instruction because that's a part of how we focus on the creator he said he stood up to read and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu Isaiah unrolling the scroll he found the place where it was written. Now guys, if you've never experienced a Torah scroll before, this is a rather fun exercise. There's no chapters and verses. I'm going to read the next piece and without looking at your Bible, tell me which chapter and verse it came from. The Spirit of Adonai is upon me because He has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind to release those we have been crushed to proclaim a year of favor to Adonai. Any takers? Sean is not going to help you this round. 
What we understand is Isaiah 61. He just knew as the portion that starts with the spirit of Adonai is upon me. So you take one side of the scroll and you flip it, you flip it, you flip it, you flip it. And while you're doing it, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading until you come to the point and you go, here it is. Now what I want you to know is this is not some random section of Isaiah that he decided to teach on the day. If you go into synagogue in the customs, they would study out the portions. Okay, because we don't have chapter and verse, people would be taught by memorizing sections of the Bible. Okay, so they would go through the first five books basically once every three years. Today they do it once a year. That's called studying the parasha, the portion. Now you don't have, you can't take it home and go and study it. It was read and read and read and read and read until it became not only memory but heart condition. I need to memorize it because I have to do it. Guys, I'm not just talking about picking up your Bible and then flipping through a verse or a chapter and then forgetting five minutes later what you read. I'm talking about studying it so that it becomes part of you because that's who you are. We have chapters and verses that came up later to help us get there quicker, but man, these guys really grabbed in. They dug in and it became part of who they were. And as he studied it out, they would add something called the Haftorah portion, which is basically something from the prophets that echoes the Torah portion that they were studying at that time. Now this is a cycle every three years, and he just happens to pitch up in Nazareth when this Haftorah portion is read. So as was their custom, when you read the Word of God, everybody stands, you read it, we close it, we put God's Word away, because when the King speaks, you need to be paying attention. And once His Word gets put away safely, you all sit and then we can talk about it. I want to let that sink in a little bit, because I think we miss this. Dust off your Bible, half, one eye open, very occasionally just read over because you know it might be something that you have to do to pat yourself on the back when you feel better, and then you go to sleep. These are the very words of God. Stand up and pay attention. You have a copy in your home. These guys used to have to leave their houses and go sit in a synagogue so that they could hear it, so they could have it. Not every community had a Bible class. It was the wealthier ones that could afford one. We're spoiled, and because we're spoiled, we're lazy. We take it for granted. How long has this thing been sitting on my shelf and for me not getting it into me that I would be able to go, if this is important to God, surely it should be important to me. This is why we teach the way we do, because it doesn't just about repetition, it's not just about one verse, man, it's about changing who you are. So he comes up and he reads this section, and I want you to hear what he says in verse 20. It says, after closing the scroll and returning it to the Shamash, the servant of the deacon, he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them and he says, today... As you have heard it read, the passage in the Tanakh is fulfilled. Now we need to be very careful. This word fulfilled sometimes means, in our Western logic, means it's done. As in, when you and a dry cleaner have a contract, I give you my dirty pants, you expect money in return. When I get clean pants, I give you money, the contract is now finished. This word fulfilled means to uphold and establish, is to make it full in front of your eyes. He's not doing away with it. He's saying from now on you will see this in fullness. Not just read it and go, oh, we look forward to the day. And he says, here it is. Listen to the next piece. It says, everyone was speaking well of him and marveling that such appealing words were coming from his mouth. They were even speaking, can this be Joseph's son? Now, I want you very quickly to reread that portion. 
The Spirit of Adonai is upon me because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the, for the imprisoned, renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim the year of favor to Adonai. Listen to their response. They were marveling at such appealing words. They were speaking well of him. What about what he just said strikes you to stop and go, we really like what you're saying, that's amazing. You don't really see it, do you? No. Remember he's quoting from Isaiah. So go to Isaiah 61 quickly. I'll get to my point in a bit, guys. If you're new to this, with me gathering on flowers, I do apologize. No. Okay, so if you look at your Bible, Isaiah 61, verse 1, right? The Spirit of Adonai is upon me because Adonai has anointed me to announce good news to the poor, and so he goes on. Do you guys all agree that's a portion he quoted? And they marveled at such wonderful words that they were saying. Remember, he was in Nazareth. He didn't say this in Capernaum, there's a point. A rabbi is always teaching. I want you to scroll up a little bit and I want you to go to Isaiah 60. And we're going to start reading from 17. It says, For bronze I will bring you gold, for iron I will bring you silver, bronze in place of wood and iron in place of stone. I will make shalom your governor, peace your governor, and righteousness your taskmaster. Violence will no longer be heard in your land, desolation or destruction within your borders. Instead, you will, be, you will call your, your walls salvation. You will call your walls Yeshua and your gates praise. No more will the sun be your light by day, nor your moonlight shine on you. Instead, Adonai will bring you light forever and your God, your glory. Has this happened? Yeshua was running into the statement. Let's see what he says. No longer will the sun go down, your moon will no longer wane, for Adonai will be your light forever, your days of mourning will end. All your people will be Sadukim righteous, they will inherit the land forever, they will be the branch I planted. Now this is where it becomes personal to Nazareth. The word Netzeret comes from the word shoot, as in the shoot of a tree. This is the word they use here for branch. So they believed that they were going to be the ones that brought this thing in. We are the shoot. We are the branch. We are in Netzevet. Are you starting to understand why when he says this thing is now being fulfilled in your eyes, they thought the town was going to be lifted up. They looked at him and they said, yes, finally it's Nazareth's time. Remember what they said that when, um, when they said that they found the Messiah? They said, where's he come from? He says, Netzeret. What was the other disciples' response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They were like this small little town that people overlooked. Maybe about five to ten families at most. You know, don't worry about Nazareth. Nothing good is going to come out of there. But we have this prophecy, man. And Yeshua stands up and he goes, now's the time. But they, they saw themselves as the branch, not that he was the branch. You with me? Okay. Now I don't want to lose you, just listen carefully. My handiwork in which I take pride, the smallest will grow to a thousand, the weakest will become a mighty nation. I, Adonai, that when the right time comes, will quickly bring it about. Nazareth gets excited. Let's turn back to Luke. Remember the last words we read. Can this be Yosef's son? Verse 23. Then Yeshua said to them, No doubt you will quote to me this prophet, Dr. Q, yourself. We've heard about all the things that have been going on in Capernaum. Now do them here in your hometown. Yes, he said, I tell you that a prophet is accepted, that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. It's true, I'm telling you, when Elijah was in Israel, 
and the sky was silver for three and a half years, so that all the land suffered a severe famine. There were many widows, but Elijah, Eliyahu, was sent to none of them, only to the widow in Sarfat in the land of Sidon. Now I want you to hear Passover again. We looked at it from the point of, I can distinguish between my people and who's not. I'm the bread of life for the Jew, I am the bread of life for the Gentile. But there is also another application. Those who follow me will be called my sheep and those who don't. Now listen, he says to them, they say, give us a sign so that we can believe you. He says, well, he already knew their heart. He says, weren't there lots of widows in Israel, but Elijah was only sent to a lady in Sidon. This was a Gentile lady. She was in Phoenicia. Also, there were many people with leprosy, Ta'arite, in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. But none of them were healed, only Naaman, the Syrian, another Gentile. So he's saying, listen, if you don't want to believe me, I can tell the difference between my people and not. You with me? He says, back when we were in Egypt and we were dealing with this place, there were people that heard the word, a mixed multitude that started to pay attention and they said, if, this, if they said this is going to happen, their God is going to make it happen and they started to listen. And then there were those who refused to listen. What I'm showing you is you, you can literally have God standing before you. If you don't want to follow the word of God, then you won't. The best teacher in the world, the most, let's say he was, I, I don't even know the right word for this, that he was led by the Ruach. He was in fact saturated by the Ruach. He was fully spirit empowered and yet people still do not follow. See, God looks at your heart condition and He says, listen, are you going to be like those 4,000 oaks that heard one testimony and pitched up? Or are you going to be like the centurion servant who was a Gentile man who said, don't even, don't even come into my house. I, it's not even necessary. Just say the word, it's already done. And Yeshua said, I haven't even seen faith like this in all Israel. Because when I come and I stand before you, you say, show me a sign. Guys, look at the heart condition between the two people. I'm either standing with him, trusting in him, or I'm looking for excuses not to. Plagues 4, 5, and 6, I can distinguish between my people and not. You with me? All right, last set of plagues. Plagues 7, 8, and 9. What was the point of, of plagues 7, 8, and 9? says, I have no equal. Let's parallel that with Yeshua's ministry. Can you think of two miracles that maybe have never been done before? Hmm? Yeah, Lazarus, right? We're going to get to Lazarus in a minute. Oh, you know what? Let's deal with him now. But before even Lazarus happened, it was another miracle. In John chapter 11, we hear about this man, Eleazar Lazarus. And they tell him, Rabbi, the guy who you like, you know, he's kind of sick, you better come quickly. And he goes, okay, the sickness will not end in death. And they were like, oh, okay, it's sorted, don't worry about it, he's got this covered. He says, oh, don't worry, Lazarus is sleeping. And they're like, oh, it's good that he gets some rest. It's always good to have a good snooze, let the body recover. And he goes, no, guys, he's dead. Now, I, you just got to, this doesn't make sense to most people, right? Because, I mean, can you imagine? Come quickly or he will die. And then he goes, I'll get there later. You ever feel like God's just not pitching up when you're asking, like, I, I need it right now. Can you just, you know, this, this is life and death. And he goes, I, I know, I mean, I know. He's not dead one day, he's not dead two days, he's like on the third day he starts well singing there and it's around the fourth day when he says, all right, let's go see how Lazarus is doing. Now well, you've got to stop and you've got to think. In our logic, 
we've missed it. We've missed our opportunity. We've missed this reality. And we go, guys, you can study out the scriptures. Most people were resurrected within a three-day period. Because, and that led to a sort of a superstition idea. Um, can you bring up a picture of the, the front of the golden tooth? Okay, that the soul would hang around for three days, but after three days, well, guys, he's just gone. There's nothing more we can do. Okay, if we had an Elijah, if we had an Elijah, fine, that would be different, as long as it's within this period. To the point that when Bruce brings up the picture, you'll see the picture of the garden tomb is a place where they believed Yeshua could have been laid. Is there, you see this little window at the top, and then most people go, you yeah, know, that's because of the smell. Okay, so it wasn't for the smell, it was the place so that the soul could escape. Alright, you see that window where the curse is at the top there? Okay, that's for the soul to live. Again, guys, when we start looking at spiritual realms, Yeshua walked through walls and doors. Okay, you didn't need to leave a window open or anything of such so that he could get in. The spirit will move through. Same way we must understand demonic activity doesn't need a literal open window. So what we need to understand is that they looked at that picture and then they go, What did they say when Yeshua pitched up at the door? Yeah, if you were only here just sooner, anything you do, he says, do you believe? Yeah, yeah. He says, even now if you ask. So Yeshua stands looking at his tomb and I want you to understand how personal this is. He's looking at Lazarus but he sees himself. In a couple of days time, he's going to be the guy wrapped up in the tomb. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. And a guy who had been dead for four days, all of a sudden walks out and he goes, Hey, you see God has no equal. He's not Elijah. He's not Elisha. This is Yeshua. Stand up and pay attention. I'm not just a prophet. I am bigger than what you think. He comes up. John chapter 9 for your notes. Lazarus is John 11. Funny enough, two points for anybody who can tell me Lazarus' actual Hebrew name. No faith that Frank is here. Okay. Eliezer. What does Eliezer mean? God is my help. In the very miracle of the guy's name who was called up, God is my help. Who is Yeshua? I have no equal. Picture up. John chapter 9. It's a fascinating story. It's only 12 verses long. They walk along and they see this man who was blind from birth. Right? And the disciples get into discussion, well, who did it? Whose sin is it? Was it the parents' sin? Was it his sin? What, what was it? Because sickness and sin in this time sort of went hand in hand. Okay, guys, it's not always the case, right? So if someone gets a cold, it might not be sin. But if someone gets a cold, it also might be. Don't be... Let me say this nicely. Do not come to the place when someone is sick that we expect them to renounce sin that they've done in their life when they haven't done it. It just might mean that you're sick. Okay? So sometimes you're going to get a headache. Maybe it means you should stop watching what you're watching or sometimes it means drink more water. You'll know the difference. But when I'm dealing with sin, they look at him and they go, whose sin is it? And he goes, no. This is so that the glory of God will make manifest. You see, God has an agenda. I have no equal. And if you read this story, which I absolutely love this, because this guy gets, he, he takes some mud, he picks it up and he puts it on and he sends him for a walk. Go to the pools of Siloam. And for those of you who have walked with us near the pools of Siloam, this is not some flat little, but this thing's like this, and then it's rocks, and then it's all the rest of it. You're holding on to things because it's slippery. Send the blind guy to the pools of Siloam. It makes perfect sense to me. So he sends him up, and he goes for this walk, and then he goes in. Remember, in his faith, he goes and he rinses out, and all of a sudden he can see. Now understand the miracle of this. Something missing here in his ocular nerves and how the brain is connected was not connected. He took mud. 
Remember where you were made, Adama. You were part of the soil. And he fixes that whole thing. Guys, we can't do that today. With all the technology and all the things, we're still baffled at how this works. And he goes, give me some mud, we're going to make a little bit of paste. And he goes, okay, my boy, walk down here quickly. And then go to the pools of Seluach. Sent. Because Yeshua was sent. And he ends up there and then he gets interrogated, right? Because now this is such a massive miracle. How can we dispute it? They go to the point where this guy himself says, no one has ever heard throughout history of a man being healed who was born blind. And if you pay attention to the way when he gets questioned and he gets interrogated and he gets questioned and he gets interrogated and he's questioning you, look at his responses. He goes, who was it? It was this man, Yeshua. Verse 11, verse 12 says he was a prophet. Verse 3, oh, verse, um, sorry, 38. I can't read my own handwriting. Verse 38, he pictures up and Yeshua says, I'm going to paraphrase, how's the vision? He's like, I can see. And he goes into this story about the Son of Man and eventually he says, who is the Son of Man? He says, I am He. He says, Lord. And I'm just thinking, you know what, we are so busy stuck on the physical miracle, you know, we want to see the cool stuff, you know. I want to, I want to see, I want to see legs straight and I want to see, I want to see people's sicknesses gone. I want to see paralyzed people walk, but that's not the point of the miracle. The point of the miracle is this, he was a man who was a prophet, who is God. I realized now that his eyes were truly open, it wasn't just physical, it was a spiritual reality. He recognized Yeshua as God. That's the point of the miracle. I have no equal. You know that we, we sing it, you know, a lot. I once was blind, but now I see. Those were this man's words. He says, I don't know how he did it, but I know this. Once I was blind, and now I see. I want you to see what he saw. He wasn't just marveling at the funny colors and the faces and all the things that he had longed to see his entire life, but now he saw God face to face. You want to pray for someone, you want to see a miracle. That's the miracle. The body will decay. It doesn't make a difference. Lazarus died again. Man, open up their eyes. That's the point. This is what Passover is all about. He says, like, do you not see my life? Do you not see me? Challenging the gods in your very own life, asking the question, are you walking with me? I'm here. I'm standing in front of you. My word has declared it. I will fulfill it. I'm here. But you've got to get up and you've got to leave, man. You can't have one foot in Egypt and one foot out. You've got to leave everything you understood about who you were and you've got to find out who God is because if you find out who He is, you'll find out who you are or what you were made for. Your identity is in Him. Nothing less, nothing more. Are you guys still okay? Can I carry on for another 10 minutes? I asked you to go and look up in Exodus 12 and sort of bring across the, the, the sort of the events in the instructions. Okay? So God said it's the first day of the first month. <clears throat> I want you on the 10th day of the first month to bring a lamb into your house. Now what I want to do is I want to quickly parallel that instruction with what we see in Yeshua and those last days before the crucifixion and after. Because he's trying to tell you a story and this is only the beginning. Passover was only the beginning guys. It is not yet done. Just like the bridegroom said in the beginning of Cana, he said, you gave the 
okay wine in the beginning but you said the best for last I want you to know that the best is still coming his story is not yet over there will be an outpouring so he told you to take in the lamb and inspect the lamb on the tenth day we can parallel that with two points one in John 11 with the raising of Lazarus it talks about that six days before the Passover if we take it from the 14th then we count back okay using the nights and, and the rest of it how it links up is it actually points us back to the tenth day of the first month also Daniel's prophecy in Daniel's timeline, not to confuse you, from the time of the building of the walls and the plaza, you are to count 173,880 days to the point Messiah will arrive. Theologians have taken it from the decree of them for Nehemiah to go back and establish the walls, and that's not a biblical tablet, that actually comes out of Persia. And they've carried it over and they counted the days all the way to the point where they came up to the 10th day of the first month. I'm sharing with you what they found. The lamb pitched up on the triumphal entry. You ought to take that lamb into your house and you ought to inspect it for the next four days. Where was Yeshua over the next four days? In whose house? God's house. You see, in a Hebraic understanding, the temple is not just called the temple, it's called Beit HaMikdash, is the holy house. Because that's where a picture of the tabernacle where God dwelt. You stay in a tent. God says, this is the place where I will rest my feet forever. That's why the pillars on the outside, one called Yakin and one called Boaz, to remind us of the feet of God. Yeshua was in and out that temple and he was being inspected. Remember, they challenged him, they questioned him, and then they could not find any fault with him to the point where even Pontius Pilate goes, I don't get it, why is this guy here? So not only was he declared clean or unblemished by the, the fact that there was nothing they could find fault with him by the Jews, but at the same time the Gentiles looked at them and he said, this guy is perfect. We have an unblemished lamb. You are to take the lamb and it is to be slain at twilight. Remember, twilight means literally between the two evenings, so plus minus 3 p.m. around there. Yeshua dies at twilight. He indeed, he says, it is done. It is finished. That's exactly the word the high priest would have said when he was slaughtering the Passover lamb. He says you are to take the blood with, uh, with a hyssop branch and paint the blood on the doorpost of your house. A picture of a chai. And according to John 19, verse 28, the soldiers offered Yeshua something to drink. They used a sponge and a hyssop branch. It says that the Passover meal is to be eaten with bitter herbs. And I want you to remember, Yeshua was betrayed by Yehudai Ishkriot, Judas Iscariot. And it was the bitterness of betrayal that he understood. The Lamb, Yeshua Himself, according to 1 Corinthians 5, which we will read in a bit. No bones were broken, according to Exodus. Remember, they came up to Him and they wanted to break His legs. Why? You die quicker. Remember the crucifixion? Generally speaking, they would give you a cross beam. And if they thought they would like to kill you slowly, but they didn't feel that bad about it, you know, they would tie you by your ropes. You know, Josephus says this, they used nails for those they hated. What kills you in crucifixion? Asphyxiation. Water build up from your feet all the way up until eventually you can't breathe. It's nice and slow. The only way you can catch a breath when the water builds up nice to the top is that you push up off the bottom. I gave you a little pedestal, so I wanted to give you a little bit of hope. And you would pull yourself up and as long as your strength would last, you would take a breath until it failed and then slowly you would fight and fight and fight until you couldn't fight anymore. Crucifixion didn't take hours, it took days.
you must understand that Lamb knew that that was coming. He did it knowingly that he was dying for you. You have to choose to take that blood and put it over your house. You. They came to break his leg so that he would drown quicker and they found that he was dead. So to check him, remember they stabbed him in the side and they saw water and blood come out. What we know today from a medical field is that that is a sign of a massive heart attack. So according to the eyewitness testimonies, doctors today have said there is no doubt that he, would, that he didn't just pass out from the pain, he didn't slip into a coma and then woke up later. Guys, he was dead. There's no way around it. So they didn't break his bones. It says, the leftovers of the Passover lamb is to be burnt up. You partake of the lamb, leave nothing after. Yeshua offered up his spirit. The picture of that lamb taking what was left and being put on that fire was a symbol of a burnt offering. Okay, that burnt offering basically means everything of me ascends. Yeshua gave everything he had just to give you a chance to have a relationship with God. I'm going to say that again. To give you a chance. It's up to you to go. We are to eat the Passover meal with unleavened bread. Yeshua was buried at the time of unleavened bread. He was unleavened, which means in this context he was without sin. You have to paint the blood on the doorpost. Remember I told you about that shape. Yeshua indeed sat down at a triclinium shaped table, which was a U shape. When he ate the, what we understand to be a Pesach meal. He went out in the garden of Gethsemane to fulfill or to show us that, remember, God said in Exodus, this will be a night of vigil for you. Now remember I said, you know that you've got the blood on the door. You've gone through all of these instructions meticulously because if you don't, death enters your house. And he looks at that and he says, this will be a night of vigil for you because I'm watching over you. Yeshua ate the Passover meal. He's been in and out, up and down, walking those streets. Guys, trust me, when you walk through the Kidron Valley, it's not for games. You need to be a fairly fit person. And he walked in and out every time. After a whole meal, he goes out. It's probably about midnight. And he's praying. Why? Because it was a night of vigil. What did he say to his disciples? Could you not watch with me? There was great lamenting. There was mourning over the firstborn. In the tenth of plagues, remember, indeed, a great cry went up. Now, what I want you to see is as God's heart. When He laid His firstborn down, so that you could have life, what happened to the curtain? Instead of tore from top to bottom, right? Okay, guys, I need you to understand that this is not some little itsy bitsy curtain. It was apparently around five to six inches thick. It took over 300 men to pick it up. It was changed twice a year according to Mishnahs and uh, Josephus, who was a Levite himself. And from what I remember, the weave actually ran horizontally, not from top to bottom. So if it was going to tear, it should have torn because of the way it's somewhere in the middle. But it didn't. It tore from top to bottom. Why? The writer of Hebrews will tell us that, that we may boldly enter into the Holy of Holies. With the blood of Christ, we have now access because our sin has been dealt with. But I want to make this a little bit personal. When someone mourns in the Middle East, what happens? Father takes his clothes and he rents it down. When Yeshua died, God tore his garment. You see, we look at this and we can celebrate, man, and we should celebrate. 
but we often don't understand the cost that came attached with it. For me to have a shot, for me to have a relationship, do you understand? For God so loved the world. I do not have the right to make excuses. I do not have the right to just justify why it's okay for me to do what I like or not walk like Christ. The cost was high. God looked at you and He said, I've taken you that seriously to give you that shot, man. Grab it with everything you have. I don't know about you, but many years ago I had to make a decision. I would not let anyone or anything get in my way with my relationship with God. That was too big for me. If I need to stand here by myself, I will stand. If I need to pray by myself, I will pray. If I need to walk this out by myself, I will do it. But if you walk with me, that would be amazing. Too many people. It's too hard. I'm not in the right space. I'm not good enough. Maybe when my family understands, Tell me when you look and you picture that cross and you're sure giving up everything he had and God rendering his garment and he said, do you not understand the cost? You tell me whatever you're thinking is good enough. Remember when I said it's not just about the Passover lamb, we've already spoken about unleavened bread, but we'll look at first fruits. The wave offering of first fruits is that we would come in and our priest would take a piece or a sheaf, an omer, of barley and he would wave it. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to think and I mean, what must he must have been thinking? Like, thank you for the bread. It's probably about as far as he got. But to fulfill that mitzvah in its fullness that we would understand that is that Yeshua was resurrected three days and three nights later at the time of first fruits. Indeed, he says he is our first fruits of resurrection. The story doesn't end at the cross, guys. It's only the beginning. That's so that you can get into the kingdom. Now it's up to you to live for the kingdom. Live for the king. Amen? I want to quickly read two things as we end off. You guys can follow me. We're going to quickly touch on 1 Corinthians 5 and then I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 11. One Corinthians 5 verse 7 and 8. I'm going to read from 6. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6 says, Your boasting is not good. Don't you know the saying, it takes only a little chametz, a little leaven, to leaven a whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old chametz, so that you can be a new batch of dough, because in reality you are unleavened. For our Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the meal, the Seder, not with leftover chametz, the leftover leaven, the leaven of wickedness and evil, but with the unleavened bread of purity and truth. He says, let us, let me remind you, the Corinthians were predominantly a Gentile group of people. He said, let us celebrate it. But get rid of your boasting. Don't think that you've got this, well, let me say it this way. Don't make any mitzvah. I'm going to say this slowly. Do not let any mitzvah any instruction. Don't make it about you. Make the instruction about God. If it's important to Him, it should become important to you. If it's about how I feel about it, then I have taken the throne. If it's about how He feels about it, then I will follow through. 
Put yourself aside. Put away your chametz. Put away your boasting. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11. And again, you've got to love the Bible. It's honest, right? Not everybody was doing what they needed to do. I'm going to read from verse 17. Corinth was an amazing place, but they had some speed bumps that they had to get, they had to get right. Just like every other congregation, guys, families are messy. We're not going to get it right every time, but we're going to fight and we're going to push through. It says, but in giving you the next instruction, I do not praise you because when you meet together, it does more harm than good. Um, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 17. Okay, so when you get together, it does no more harm than good. We need to be careful that we are united. There's no division. It says, for in the first place, I hear that when you gather together as a congregation, you divide up into cliques. And to a degree, I believe it. Granted that there must be some division among you in order to show who are the ones in the right. Now that's a little bit crazy, right? We get here, we get together, and then it's no, no, we understand things differently. You don't understand them. And guys, that's how, many, that's how we get to so many different congregations nowadays. You know... You don't have the truth, we have the truth. Your past is amazing, but mine's better. You guys are, you, you're only understanding a little bit of the picture. Come over here and I'll teach you the rest. Are you following Christ or are you following man? We need to make sure we stay unified. As a body, not just as a congregation. It says, thus when you gather together, it is not to eat the meal of the Lord. This is Pesach Seder. Because as you eat your meal, each one goes ahead of his own so that the one stays hungry while another is already drunk. Now this is a bit of a problematic statement, don't you think? Other people are just arriving. We're not eating in unity. Some people are jumping ahead. Some people are starving. Some people are started with the wine. It says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or are you trying to show your contempt for God's community and embarrass those who are poor? What am I supposed to say to you? Am I supposed to praise you? Well, for this, I don't praise you. For what I received from the Lord, just what I passed is what I passed on to you, that the Lord Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had made the bracha a blessing, he broke and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as a memorial to me. Do this in remembrance of me. This is why you eat the Passover. It is to remind you. Likewise, also the cup after the meal saying, guys, that's important. I'll explain in the next session. This cup is the new covenant affected by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it as a memorial to me. For as often as you can eat the bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats the Lord's bread or drinks the Lord's cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of desecrating the body and the blood of the Lord. It is not just a come and sit down and eat scenario. We do it with thanksgiving, we do it cleansed. Right now, as we build up to Pesach, you should be dealing with your heart condition and finding out where you're getting it wrong. Guys, that's an individual thing. I'm not looking at... I'm going to pick on Nessie and go, oh, Nessie is weird. Ah, she's different. She needs to get right to the Lord. I'm not supposed to be focusing on me and going, you know what? I am not in His perfect image yet. Lord, Father, where am I getting it wrong? Take the broken away from me. Fill me with your Ruach so that I would better reflect you. And if I'm real about it, I'm not focusing on you because I realize that I only sit at the table by His grace. I can't look at anybody else. I'm just grateful that I'm there. So let a person examine himself first and then he may eat the bread and drink from the cup. For a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body and eats drinks judgment upon himself. This is why many among you who are weak and sick and some have died. Well, that's not popular preaching. Some of you are weak and sick, and indeed, some have died. Is this a trivial thing, do you think? Mm. 
If we could examine ourselves, we would not come under judgment. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you gather together to eat, wait for one another. If someone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you come to meet together, it will not result in judgment. He says, guys, we know this is going to be a long night. We know this is going to be a big thing. I know you all have got kids, but let's make sure we're there for the right reasons. Take the necessary preparations. Make sure you, you, you pitch up and understand that this is going to be something a little bit elaborate, but you're not doing this to feel comfortable. You're doing it for God. Guys, we have taken a, a pretty serious stance because of verses like these that we have obviously have stipulations. If you are going to pitch up and you're going to partake of the Pesach, and I'm going to reiterate this in again in the next session, is that please make sure, number one, you have to be a believer. You can't eat and drink of Christ if you don't believe in Him. Number two, it says that you will have no leaven in your houses, you will not eat of it for the next seven days. If you read Exodus 12, it says that you will be cut off. Now, I don't want to bring someone in here who's not going to take that seriously because it says, indeed, some of you are sick and weak. Because you have not taken the instruction seriously. We need to be cautious. But man, we need to be thankful. It was at a great cost that we have received our invitation to sit at the feet of God. This is His meal. And when we partake of it, we remember everything He gave us, this opportunity. And as we do, we think of things that He's done and things He's going to do. And I get it. I wish, my heart's desire is that everybody would understand that reality, but some people just don't. So let me first focus on myself and where I am so that God willing, next year, others may follow. You with me? Any questions? All right. Yes. If you have um, invited people, we have tried to mention it a few times, please make sure they understand. And they do it. You are responsible. We cannot double check everybody that comes through the doors. Our responsibility is then to deal with you, to lead you through this meal, to celebrate with you and have a good time. Be cautious. Yes, we have to take the leaven out of the house. I'm going to elaborate that with the next session. Guys, if you, please, if you're not going to be here for the next session, just watch it online. I'm going to go into dealing with the comments and dealing with the meal, what to expect, so that when you come, it'll be a faster process instead of explaining every single element for you, okay? Right, it's a big thing. When we get rid of our sin, which is a symbol of our chametz, is we get rid of it. You don't hide it away and then bring it back. Well, hopefully not, right? Okay. Shall we pray? All right, stand if you'd like to stand. Father, we just want to thank you for this time. Father, we thank you that we can study your word, Father, and just really understand your heart. Father, we just, we just want to give you glory for the sacrifice, Father, of Yeshua, that we can come into this time and remember it, Father. And I just pray that as a family, that we would sit down at that meal as part of the body, Father, wherever people are, that they would really just internalize this that you would highlight for each and every one of us where we're falling short, Father, so we may truly sit here and be chemed free. Father, help us not to boast in ourselves, help us not to focus on ourselves, but Father, help us to focus on you. Father, we thank you for our possibility. We thank you because of Yeshua and because of what he's done, Father, that we are able to sit and celebrate, Father, truly celebrate the fact that you have set us free. We look forward to the celebration every year, Father. We just want to thank you for that blessing.
We want to give you glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright guys, just a quick one. I've got a, we, we as fellowship um, printed a few Seder guides as in the order of the meal. We tried to, we did it a, a, a number of years ago, last year or before, I can't remember anymore. To try and recount not only the traditional elements that you might see, but also the biblical narrative. If you are new and you do not have one, okay, I've got the box here, just wait for us over there, okay, and we are going to give out sparingly. We only printed a few, just will be at no cost to you, but it will be a good guide for the night so that when you go through this, hopefully the elements and the teaching notes that we've had at the back will help you understand why you're doing certain things, okay? All right.